Hi, everybody. I'm here with Dr. Jocka Kalsa. She's one of my very good friends, and we kind of look like twins, too. People always get us mixed up. She's an acupuncturist, a doctor of oriental medicine. I'm a chiropractor. Um, I invited her to come talk with us today because we're doing a whole series on diabetes. And I was telling her earlier that I wanted to do one post on diabetes, but then once I started writing, I realized there's so many aspects to diabetes and there's so many layers. And depending on when you talk to different practitioners, like there's the Western medical perspective of how it starts. And then as a chiropractor, I have certain perspectives. And then with uh, traditional Chinese medicine, there's certain perspectives also. She's, how long have you been, been in practice? I've been in practice since 2003. Okay, so yes. at this recording, we're 2017, so that's 14 years. Wow, fast with yeah, the math. Yeah, I know, yes. right? <laughs> Thanks. Um, you have to be with little kids. And then she's also, um, you're a yoga teacher trainer. Yes. And so you go all over the world teaching. Yes, I'm, I'm an international te yoga teacher trainer with KRI. And KRI is also my publisher. That's the Kundalini Research Institute. And we wrote a book called Enlightened Bodies. It's for people that love yoga, people that love health and wellness. And it examines the way that the body works, both from a subtle and a physical perspective. Yeah, and as a practitioner, I really love this book because I Thank can you. go in, like I'm a yogi, yoga practitioner and also as a healer and practitioner, it kind of covers everything. Like I can go in and find out the physiology of each organ and then you all go into the subtle aspects of things and the energetic aspects of things and then you talk about different yoga and food and kriyas, um, like meditations you can do to change your physiology and help give some more support to those organs or to your nervous system and immune system. So it's really an invaluable book, actually. Like I thank you. Yeah, I, and I remember when you were writing it. So it's like it was a lot, a lot of, of work, it was a lot of work. And it's a beautiful book. So um, we'll put the link in with these posts also. So you can purchase it if you'd like it, take a look at it. And I highly recommend it. It's something if you are interested in health at all, just having it on your bookshelf just to even, I use it as a reference book a lot of times too. Great. We yeah. are hoping to make it a fun textbook for people. Yeah, it's super yeah. fun. Yeah. So that's why I wanted to have her. So I wanted to tell you about all of her great qualities and why she's so, <laughs> such a wealth of information to be able to talk on this topic of diabetes because she can kind of talk about anything. So, but we're focusing on diabetes today. So any questions or comments so far? I'm part? excited to talk about it. Okay. I want to share okay. what I, how I can help people cool. with this. Okay, cool. So one of the questions I wanted to ask is how does diabetes, from a traditional Chinese medicine standpoint, how does it develop in people? Like how do people get to that point of being either pre-diabetic or actually diabetic? Okay, so we're talking about type 2 adult onset diabetes. Okay. So um, basically... In Chinese medicine, it's a little bit, it's a different way that we explain things. And we look at that every person is born with what's called constitutional jing or constitutional qi in their body. And what is qi? Like how do you... So qi is like the prana or the the life force that's okay. moving through your body. Okay. And you, you get qi both through the heavenly qi that you breathe in. It comes in through your mouth and nose and goes into the lungs and transforms into energy that your body can use. And you also get chi through the food that you digest and what you choose to eat. And then another way that you get chi is when the conception happens, the sperm and the egg meet, you're given a trust fund of chi that you get to use your entire life. Wow. And that's called your constitutional chi. And even the very moment when you're conceived, that moment actually affects the quality of that chi. So it's a lifelong story of how that chi unfolds in your wow. life that it affects you and kind of scripts you for a particular illness or a particular ailment or inclination towards good health or even difficult health. I have like 20 questions just about that, <laughs> <laughs> but I just stay focused on this topic, but we'll do that another time because I like that's so, I didn't know that. That's it's interesting. Okay. Let me just add one more thing about that. Okay. So you get this trust fund of chi, and then you also get a checking account of chi, and you fill up that checking account with food and with lifestyle choices and with exercise. And okay. that's fundamentally where adult onset diabetes might come in 
if you are making poor choices, you might be oriented more towards getting diabetes. And then if you also had kind of a deficiency of chi to start out with, which everybody has a weakest link, everybody has something that's not working right, um, then you can sort of head towards diabetes as well. So are you saying like with this checking book, checking account analogy, so what I'm taking it as is that we have things we're doing all along in our lives that we build up to a certain point. So it's not like we're diagnosed with diabetes and it was just from the past like six months that something we weren't doing right or, or there was some imbalance somewhere. It sounds like from what you're saying, it's like all along the way. It's a cumulative effect and people can have this idea like, well, you got diabetes because you were just eating sugar all this time. Yes, sugar could cause diabetes. Lots of eating poor foods might cause it, but it could also be genetically you're inclined towards diabetes and you could eat one little thing that's not so great and start moving towards diabetes. Whereas somebody else that bought their body wasn't kind of set up for diabetes, they would not get it. So it's not like it's the person's fault necessarily. It's also genetics that play a role in it. Like for example, they say that people that live for hundreds of years and survive through famine, those people genetically were predisposed to, to um, they're predisposed to diabetes because now in this time of plenty where there are oh, Cheetos and all kinds of food all over the place, their bodies can't handle it and it's much easier for them to get diabetes than other people that grew up in, or other people that genetically were not exposed to famine. That is really fascinating because when I was doing my research to it looked like there was a lot of um, specific populations that were more prone to it, like African-American descent, Hispanic, Native American. And it sounds like now that you're saying that, that ex like actually gives a lot of awareness around like all those cultures seem to be in areas where there were a lot of, where there was more a famine. predisposition yeah because right. like if we look at first nation people it was only in the 18 the middle of the 1800s so that's what 160 years ago that they started getting exposed to processed foods and more food like when they started being controlled by the united states government and they were given sugar and flour and those kinds of products then before that, they'd lived through periods of severe famine. They could last, you know, through very hard, very harsh climates. So then they don't have as many generations of getting used to processed food. That is so fascinating. Wow. So you find, like, so from the, the traditional Chinese medical perspective, when you're talking about diabetes, that's a lot of how people kind of develop that, um, that predisposition. Like one is kind of that, that, factor of kind of what your genetics are in the first place and then all the things we've been doing over 20, 30, 40 years. Yes, like I believe cultivated foods and processed foods like breads and baked goods and over processed foods are a, a great contributor to the rise in the epidemic of diabetes, both for populations that have a special sensitivity to it and also for just the anybody from you know European descent myself you know my ancestors were eating bread and drinking lots of wine for centuries <laughs> but I still could get diabetes from eating too much processed food and not exercising and that kind of thing okay so can you go a little bit more into that what kind of things you know over a period of years that people like lifestyle habits that people have that could contribute to that kind of yeah, I think it's really interesting. In Chinese medicine, we call diabetes wasting and thirsting illness. Mm. And it comes from a deficiency of yin. Yin is like the moist quality of your body. Okay. So you can test it on yourself. If you're suffering from a deficiency of yin, you will feel hot, irritable, inflamed. You might have to urinate a lot. You might feel scratchy and have wounds on your body that are not healing. And these are the same kinds of symptoms that people with diabetes would get. So you can actually test it on yourself. You can push yourself into a, sounds kind of scary, but you could give yourself a day of yin deficiency to feel what it's like. Go to the, the movies and order yourself a supersized soda <laughs> and uh, junior mints and you know some goobers and just go for it and eat all that. And the next day, you'll wake up with some of these symptoms. You may feel hot, irritated, have to urinate a lot, 
maybe have um, itchy parts on your body, and you might push yourself into a little bit of yin deficiency, which is basically you're having precursor to what it is to have diabetes. Wow. So diabetes would be too much sugar in the blood and you're not able to clear that sugar out of your body properly from not enough exercise and from the adrenals and pancreas and spleen being depleted. So what it sounds like if you're, if someone's doing years and years of this kind of eating the way you said, like I think most, a lot of people are going to the movies and buying popcorn <laughs> and junior mints and yes. bloopers, and that happens a few times a week even with people, not necessarily at the movies, but at home. Like, But I've they noticed, might be overeating sugar. Right, and yes. I've noticed in our culture, and we even have like a, a healthy community, but we could easily have cake almost every day, cookies <sighs> a couple times a day, candy, like it's in our environments all right. the time. So. Right, we love our dessert in our community too. Yeah. A lot of it is, um, on an emotional level, we have, uh, in Chinese medicine, we say that the spleen is involved in, in diabetes because we, the spleen is what longs for that sweetness. The spleen wants to have the sweetness of life. You want to feel secure. You want to feel not worried. You want to feel safe. And one of the things that kind of makes you feel that way is actually eating sugar. It's a stimulant. It gives you that high all your worries kind of get flushed out because the sugar is flushing through your body. And in Chinese medicine, we say that, that's, that the spleen craves sweet. But healthy sweet would be things like whole grains or butternut squash. That's the kind of sweets that people had hundreds of years ago. Like it was a once a year, you might get like one orange at Christmas time or <laughs> one maple syrup candy at Christmas time, you know. so. The sweet that we have nowadays is so incredibly overindulgent. Just to be able to pour yourself a glass of orange juice, just anytime you want, you can fill up a whole glass of orange juice and just drink 36 oranges at once. Like that is wow. our crazy culture that we live in where we're overindulging our spleen and, and our, pancreas. And our bodies aren't used to it. Our that bodies at are all. not really used to it and they probably never will be used to it. Yeah. So, so that's what's happening. Just like an overabundance of sugar multiple times a day. So our body's having a hard time processing that. It was what it sounds like. I hadn't even thought about it in those terms. Yes, and it we could look at it that it comes from that root problem of being overstimulated in society and constantly seeking more stimulation. That just sitting down and having a nice meal and looking out at nature, you know, we have to watch TV at the same time, we have to be talking to our friend on the phone and texting somebody else at the same time and watching TV. You know, it's all kind of a jumble of overstimulation and we need to bring it back to the simplicity of life so that we can kind of contain that longing of the spleen to be nurtured. What it really wants is to be calm and feel peaceful and feel content. And when we know how to bring those feelings into our lives by calming ourselves, by having a mindfulness or meditation practice, by taking the time that it takes to prepare healing foods and eating whole foods, then we start moving in the direction of disease prevention as opposed to <laughs> overstimulating ourselves to the point of becoming ill.